world begun and this year is beyond digital capitalism. We have had such a great sequence of events beginning with Ursula Hughes who opened the series, Brian Palmer on capitalism and temporality. Then we had um, Larry Lohman who did this great presentation on interpretation machines, what, what is typically known of it as artificial intelligence. And tonight, a talk that I've been very much looking forward to. It's our first tandem presentation because the, the essays in Socialist Register by titles have a lot of correlation. So Tanner Merlis is going to be speaking on socialists on social media platforms. And Derek Prinishan will be speaking on imagining platform socialism. It is really a great topic, one that I'm so happy that you guys both did the effort to write and that we're included in this register. I want to turn the floor over to Tanner, who is joining us from Toronto. Uh, the floor is yours, Tanner. Thank you uh, so much, Michael, and uh, thanks to the Marxist Education Project for this excellent series. Um, I'm really delighted to be here to um, give a, a sort of uh, brief overview of the, the gist of the arguments I make in my recent SR21 essay, Socialists on Social Media Platforms Communicating Within and Against Digital Capitalism. Um, I had a lot of fun putting together the slide presentation for tonight's event, um, and so um, there's a lot of images involved, and so I hope those will be uh, interesting to you. And I decided to focus more on the broad sweep of socialist media communications history um, to bring us from the late 19th century uh, up until the 21st, um, where I won't spend as much time going into elaborate detail about what I have to say about the 21st, but I'll nonetheless touch upon, upon a few key points, but put that within the sort of broader sweep of, of history uh, and the history of socialist communications, okay? So I'll get going with, uh, with Breck. So in the 1932 essay, The Radio is an Apparatus of Communication, Bertolt Breck made a positive suggestion to transform radio into a dialogical medium for many-to-many -many communications. Quote, radio is one-sided when it should be two, said Breck. And the radio would be the finest communication apparatus in public life if it knew how to receive as well as how to transmit, how to let the listener speak as well as how to hear, and thereby bring many into a relationship with many others instead of isolating them. Brecht at the time saw the state as the only entity capable of remaking radio in this way, but because radio's quote proper application might make it a revolutionary medium, Brett concluded that the bourgeois state would have no interest in sponsoring such exercises. In the 20th century, the institutions of radio were for the most part designed for one-to-many and one-way communications. It was largely used as a medium by both corporations and national governments to transmit messages to listeners separated by geographical distances. And so in the early 20th century, radio seemed to be at once a nation building instrument, a way to unify uh, national subjects within a territory over which a state exerts sovereignty. And it was also used by corporations largely to entertain, sometimes inform in the case of public broadcasting, but most of the time to expose listeners to advertisements for latest products and services capital was selling in the marketplace. So on the whole, radio shows were made to inform, entertain, and sell, not to let every listener speak and hear. It could have been a two-way dialogical many-to-many -many medium, but for the most part, we as listeners were on the receiving end of a flow of messages communicated at us and to us by large organizations, whether they be private or public. Max Radler's painting, The Radio Listener, give some expression to this idea of the radio as a means of transmitting messages to listeners. Now, television um, largely followed a similar path to that as radio, at least in the United States. Owned by corporations for the most part, TV was designed to serve capitalism's demand creation exigencies um, by transmitting advertisements for the latest commodities to millions of people. 
And so the real content for folks like Dallas Smythe and other political economists of communication were the advertisements between the scheduled shows, not the shows themselves, which basically functioned as bait to attract an audience to, of course, be exposed to an ad flow for products and services. Um, television was also serviceable to the political communication strategies of parties, politicians, and their public relations handlers. Um, a kind of mediatized political theater exposed and investigated by Joe McGinnis in the classic 1969 book, The Selling of the President, which is about the utility of television to Richard Nixon's uh, campaign at the time. Um, and when tuned into TV shows, uh, of course, viewers could see but not be seen, nor could they share what they thought about what they saw with everyone else watching. So like radio, television was a one-way, one-to-many communications medium for the most part. Nonetheless, Breck's positive suggestion for many-to-many -many communication systems seems to have come to fruition with the internet and more recently with the spread of social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So today, socialists around the world are using the internet and platforms to produce, distribute, exhibit, and consume socialist media and cultural works. And they're openly building events, movements, and organizations within digital capitalism to go beyond it. What do contemporary internet and social media platforms give to and take from socialist communicators, especially as compared to the 20th century's mass media industries, whose state and corporate owners or shapers tended to filter out and vilify most socialist ideas and expressions? So that's the question that I attempt to answer in my SR21 essay. So taking it as axiomatic that communications underpins any possibility for socialist politics, my essay historicizes socialist communications from the old media world of the 19th and early 20th centuries, all the way to the new digital media world of the early 21st. So, okay, I'll start with some history. Socialist activist organizations and parties have always engaged in multimedia communications, but their freedom to express themselves in bourgeois society has ebbed and flowed, as the major means for communicating on a massive scale have mostly been owned by the bourgeoisie, which has not been very supportive of the free expression of socialist ideas, especially when that class power was being challenged. So as a consequence of not owning substantive means of communication, and being subject to the ideas of those who do, socialists have mostly tried to spread their ideas and speak to one another and to the working class through media made by itself and its own largely small scale media operations. So returning to the work of Karl Marx, a great journalist and early socialist media communicator, the mid 19th century's most significant socialist media communicator, uh, of course, on commission to the Communist League, Marx in the first two months of 1848 with dip pen in hand, wrote the manifesto of the Communist Party. This was published anonymously by the London-based German Workers Educational Association, which used its own printing press to mechanically reproduce and bind its ink pages into a thousand or so book copies. And then it administered the works translation from German into Polish, Danish, Swedish, and French language editions. Now the League's newspaper, um, the Rhenish newspaper, which was edited by Marx, serialized the manifesto. But the first English language version of the manifesto was published in the late 1850s by the Red Republican, an English socialist newspaper. Now, exiled to London after the failure of the 1848 revolutions, Marx made his way between 1852 and 1863, of course, with modest pay from the New York Tribune, for his op-eds, which reached 200,000 readers. To most Americans of the day, Marx was known mostly as a rabble-rousing journalist, not a historical materialist philosopher. And so it's interesting just to think back to Marx's career as, as a journalist. After all, the first English language version of the manifesto only appeared in the United States in 1871 as a serial in Woodhill and Claflin's Weekly, which was a socialist feminist magazine of the age. Capital's full English volume appeared over 10 years later, five years after Marx's death in 1888. 
So in socialism's germinal period, socialists like Marx created content and organizations, mostly socialists, but sometimes bourgeois as well, as in the case of the New York Tribune, circulated that content far and wide. We can go to other contexts as well. For example, the Italian Socialist Party released the first issue of Avanti on December 25th, 1896, which was later edited or co-edited by Antonio Gramsci, who had previously written um, for, for other papers. Um, and across the Atlantic, the burgeoning Socialist Party of America, which in 1912 got nearly 900,000 votes for its presidential candidate, Eugene Debs, was running mass newspapers such as the Chicago Daily Socialist and the New York Call. Produced by a staff of over 60 people and circulated to half a million readers each week, Appeal to Reason was the biggest American socialist newspaper of that era. Uh, it ran headlines, as you see here, like capitalism rules the world. How do you like it? And papers like this did important things like serialized chapters from, from novels of the age, like Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, as a way to make proletarian literature more accessible to readers. In any case, in the late 19th and early 20th century USA, socialist media constituted a radical counter public sphere that existed on the margins of, but sometimes entered the liberal bourgeois public sphere of the day. In this era of socialist ferment in the United States, socialist media could be read, seen and heard by tens to hundreds of thousands of people. And socialists communicated to inform and persuade, to engage and defeat the ideas of their opponents and to organize the working class to their politics. That's sort of an interesting sort of period to study and, and a really excellent book on this period, you know, the heyday of sort of the radical press and socialist media in the United States is black, white, and red all over. If we jump over to another context, if we go uh, over to turn of century Russia, for example, the situation was markedly different and much more restrictive for socialist media communicators. 15 years before the revolution that propelled Vladimir Lenin's Bolsheviks to power, Lenin had proposed a model for revolutionary socialist media in the 1902 pamphlet, What is to be Done? So in the context of the Tsarist regime's repression of working class parties, the abolishment of strikes, the erasure of press freedom, and the fragmentation of socialists, Lenin conceived of a Russia-wide underground party newspaper, uh, Iskra as, quote, an enormous pair of smiths, bellows, that would fan every spark into a general conflagration. Lenin's newspaper would be made by party vanguards, circulated through clandestine networks uh, to like-minded readers, and then serve as a collective organizer of the cadre. The newspaper's role for Lenin was to propagandize the party line, expose the hypocrisy of the reigning state and capitalist class, and foment working class revolution. After the revolution and uh, following his return from exile, Lenin gave his famous 1919 What is Soviet Power speech to the Bolshevik Party Conference. And though this was recorded by gramophone and replayed by radio broadcast many years later, it was initially only listened to by those who attended the conference. So again, there was limited reach to that incredibly significant speech. Okay, so the Bolshevik state's media cultural apparatus that eventually developed throughout the 1920s and 30s, as well as those administered by its satellite states through the uh, Soviet Union, were as technologically sophisticated as they were, of course, uh, repressive. But back in the United States, the first Red Scare is basically what landed the first major blow to socialist freedom of expression and communications on a mass scale. Nonetheless, throughout the 1920s and 30s, socialist media resumed its relative freedom to be produced and consumed within the United States. And the newly formed communist parties launched all kinds of philosophical journals, newspapers, and related popular works. Uh, for example, the Communist Party USA supported the launch of the Daily Worker in 1924, which at its height achieved a circulation of about 35,000. The American cultural front uh, of the 1930s was made not just by the Communist Party, however, but by working class people themselves, who in an era of economic depression, New Deal compromises, militant labor unions, and rising fascist threats, got organized and created myriad socialist media and cultural works. So we see things like little magazines um, publishing working class stories, poems and cartoons. Here we see the Partisan Review and the New Masses as two examples of that. Uh, we saw the rise of proletarian novelist organizations such as the League of American Writers that issued political statements condemning um, historic fascism. 
uh, where there were socialist authors, of course, writing books uh, at the time. Uh, for example, Mike Gold's Jews Without Money is a classic of that period. Uh, musicians uh, that were part of the cultural front making poignant political musical works such as Billie Holiday's Love Songs or Duke Ellington's Jump for Joy collections. Um, theatrical groups and uh, playwrights launched salient plays such as Clifford Odette's Waiting for Lefty, which I had the, the good fun of, of, of acting in as Sid back when I was a university student in the, in the late 90s. So in, in the first decades or the first three decades of the 20th century, you know, it was really the high point of mass socialist parties and relatedly massive socialist media and cultural production and consumption. But for the next seven decades, um, at least in the West, at least in the liberal democratic capitalist countries of the West, successive generations of committed socialists would continually produce and circulate print and other forms of media, but their audience reach and their influence experienced a long decline. And, and this largely happened in conjunction, of course, with the Cold War, um, with the sort of prolonged anti-communism and Red Scare part two, and just the fact that we had a new kind of mass media and cultural industries emerging, uh, of course, first theorized by uh, Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer. So in the Cold War decades, the communist parties continued to run their media outlets, but as with those founded by Trotskyist political organizations and parties, they usually reached a much smaller audience than before. By the 1960s, the new left's challenge from the grassroots to higher education to both the US empire and Soviet propaganda regimes uh, could be epitomized by Michael Harrington's New America and Paul and Mary Jo Buell's Radical America, um, which again gave expression to the new movements of that era um, and, and also encouraged the growth of many vibrant scholar activist communities. And here you see some covers from Radical America of, of that time. Of course, some of these scholar activists launched um, significant magazines and journals such as the New Left Review and the Socialist Register in the UK. Um, and alongside the Socialist Journal Monthly Review established earlier in 1949, these three academic political crossover journals became especially vital in keeping the socialist tradition alive in hard times and, and of course still do. At the same time, the new left started experimenting with the new media of the age and the new media not so long ago that we now of course called old media was television. Um, and so the new left reconfigured tape recorders, cameras, video recorders and TV sets for nonprofit and a number of community activist media initiatives. Um, one of those being in 1971, Michael Schamberg's Guerrilla Television, which inspired countercultural TV projects such as TV TV, Broadside TV and University Community Vibe. Um, one of uh, my favorite experiences of that era was Dee Dee Halleck's Paper Tiger Television, which was launched in 1981. And this was a New York City based nonprofit public access TV show featuring great shows such as Herbert Schiller Reads the New York Times. And you see here a picture of Herbert Schiller, uh, one of the US's premier political economists of communication and eminent critic of American empire and communications, deconstructing the sort of bourgeois ideology of the New York Times, while also outlining quite a sophisticated Marxist theory of the media in society. At this time, you also saw things like the Situationist Internationals, Determant sort of practices, you know, um, railing against and trying to debunk the ideology of the Society of the Spectacle. And you had a whole bunch of sort of creative artistic activism of this era, devising tactics such as culture jamming, satirical parody, pranking, putting all kinds of creativity into the service of vibrant cultural resistance against the superstructures of capital. So this was again a very, very interesting moment, but, but again, um, they tended to exhibit, you know, as far as sort of socialist media production capacities and resources go, very small teams of producers, shoestring budgets, limited distribution, very small audience reach. And these types of initiatives simply could not achieve the influence on a mass scale that was once wielded by the earlier socialist parties and working class organizations. Um, and also they couldn't slow the growth of the mass media and cultural industries or the sway of, of course, the new neoliberal ideology um, that started becoming much more hegemonic in the 80s and from the 80s forward. Uh, just to give you a sense of this disparity, um, of this asymmetry of media influence, 
By the early 1980s, Radical America's readership was about 4,100. Monthly reviews was about 10,000. Um, but, you know, in 1980, that same year, um, there were 90 million people watching the CBS TV hit uh, Dallas, uh, particularly the Who Done It episode, the Who Shot JR episode. So, you know, this, the scale doesn't even sort of come close when you're looking at these very scrappy sort of socialist media capacities and projects and what's actually happening in the mainstream mass cultural industries. Nonetheless, um, even the relatively modest diffusion of the internet by the late 1990s provided the bourgeoisie and some socialists with a new and powerful means of many-to-many -many mass transmissive and dialogical communications. Something that we're only beginning to grasp and that again I try to address more deeply in my SR essay. So the internet resulted from massive public investment, and you can go back to DARPA and ARPANET and millions of dollars of sort of federal government subvention that sort of underwrote and facilitated the research and development of the core infrastructure of what we understand to be the internet. And the commercial use of the internet was illegal basically up until 1992. But it was in the mid-1990s with the Clinton administration's dream of building a national, then a global information superhighway um, that the internet basically was privatized and turned into something paid for by corporations and serviceable to online advertisers. And so you basically see the US state transferring the ownership and core operations of the internet to private hands and supporting the network's reconfiguration by new high-tech companies into the motor of a US-led globalizing digital capitalism. A 1994 New York Times story titled US Begins Privatizing Internet Operations aptly quoted tech entrepreneur Jordan Becker, quote, I see the commercial users of the internet to be the big winners here as the ent internet enters this brave new world. So throughout the 90s, the internet's potentially revolutionary message was massaged to grease the reproduction of market order. It was on the heels of this that software initially developed for public use by researchers at the University of Illinois was turned by Mark Andreessen, here featured by Time Magazine as a golden geek of the year, into Netscape, the first big for-profit web browser. And even bigger winners soon followed with the passage of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, the neoliberal legal centerpiece of the decade of massive internet speculation and massive media conglomeration and ownership concentration. This was in turn accompanied by new economy exuberance, the overvaluation of startups like Netscape and Yahoo, and the wave of mergers that led to AT&T, Comcast, and Verizon forming the internet service provider oligopoly, which as you probably know, keeps jacking up internet connection and digital service prices. At the same time, uh, the internet was seen by the US foreign policy apparatus um, to be of vital significance to the expansion and maintenance of the US empire, both for economic, geopolitical, and cultural ideological ends. In a foreign policy essay entitled In Praise of Cultural Imperialism, David Rothkopf captured the American empire's real politic of the information age. Quote, it was strategically crucial that the US do whatever is in its power to shape the global internet's infrastructure, the rules governing it and the information traversing it. This involves setting technological standards, defining software standards, producing the most popular information and cultural products and leading in the related development of the global trade and services, end quote. So capital throughout the nineties established much ownership and control over the internet um, and many websites throughout the 1990s. But it's important also to remember that the 1990s, the latter part of it at least, was also marked by the rise of a new cyber left and in indie media organizations that attempted to reconfigure or at least use the internet as a salient means for socialists and activists to speak, get heard and be seen. So the anti-globalization movement of movement protests, beginning with the Battle of Seattle in 1999, November, and the disruption of the IMF and World Bank meetings in Washington in April 2000, were cheered as the dawn of an altogether new form of mass politics. And these were very much prepared by the internet. At the same time, um, you see a lot of new forms of, of activism emerging with NGOs, unionists, students, anarchists on the front lines of these rhizomatic rebellions, 
um, doing very creative anti-corporate culture jams, uh, such as the one that you see here, and using the web to do all kinds of things. Everything from, as Naomi Klein pointed out, cataloging the latest transgressions of the World Bank to bombarding Shell Oil with faxes and emails, distributing ready-to-download anti-sweatshop leaflets for protests at Nighttown. So these net-centric protests often fueled the mass media's spectacle of the left as violent, disruptive, freakish, or incoherent. The internet sometimes even sort of was criticized as fomenting or fostering some kind of slacktivism or clicktivism, that feel-good activism which fosters the illusion of having a meaningful impact on the world without demanding anything more than joining an online group. Um, and so there are a lot of critiques of that being made, of course, at the time and in the early 2000s as well. By the turn of the millennium, with the dot-com bubble bursting and Y2K anxiety going wild, right and left cyber optimism started to lose some of its luster. Nonetheless, as 9-11 spawned the war on terror and the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, millions of people in every major city on the planet were using the internet to communicate about anti-war activism and also anti-war organizing. And they were climbing out of their computer chairs to join the largest ever global marches for peace uh, in history. The subsequent launch of new social media platforms such as Facebook in 2004, YouTube in 2005, and Twitter in 2006 um, happened amidst much hype about a shift from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0, and this reinfused new economy hubris with further revolutionary pretensions. Grifters of the Californian ideology now lauded these Web 2.0 social media corporations as revitalizers of popular sovereignty and participatory democracy. So Time Magazine named the 2006 person of the year, you. At this time, the little tech guys became the darlings of Wall Street financiers and Democratic Party politicos at the same time as they enchanted the masses with their promises of cyber empowerment. But soon after, of course, they became the world's most powerful corporations. And here we have the GAFAM or Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft, of course, as being the real uh, powerhouses, the real titans of the digital age. Nonetheless, by the time of the Arab Spring and the ad busters initiated Occupy protest of 2011, a new type of technological determinism was leading journalists to coin terms like Facebook revolution and Twitter revolution and YouTube revolution. Democratic Party innovation guru Alec Rose even touted the social internet as the Che Guevara of the 21st century. But of course, it's important to remember that smartphones did not make the new protest movements. Social media platforms did not build the, the uprisings. Human organizers did. In that regard, the digital technologies have not brought about a totally new means and a new meaning of being political. And the people using them, of course, did not unfortunately stop the global war on terror or nationalize Wall Street or bring it under democratic public control. But they did help activists to put the problems of empire and war, as well as neoliberal uh, social class antagonisms on the public mind. The failure of these network protests to bring about the mass of social changes they demanded was a valuable object lesson in how and why the rabble of the streets needs also to rebuild organizations and even try to remake parties capable of intervening in and transforming the state. Fortunately, organization building has started to happen in the United States and elsewhere, and activists are doing this, of course, with smartphone and social media platforms open for battle. In the second decade of this 21st century, a new U.S.-centered yet globalizing socialist media really started to take off, thanks in part to the millennials that were early adopters of digital technologies and also those in Generation Z who came of age when social media platforms were already interwoven with their everyday lives. So what's new? Okay, so if you look at basically media and communications and the role sort of socialists played in trying to shape that environment, you know, from roughly World War II up until the sort of turn of the 21st century, widespread and incredibly fast-moving socialist media was very, very hard to find. Nowadays, though, socialist media content is widely available to almost anyone using the internet, and in my chapter I offer many detailed ex examples of that, um, but here are just a few. Okay, so on YouTube, um, we can basically tune into what's called BreadTube. 
And bread tubes basically a word for the hundreds and hundreds of socialist channels and creators that are creating videos streaming in, in, in real time and being watched by hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of people, sometimes simultaneously. Um, a few examples of this um, um, is, you know, Vouch, who's renowned for winning live stream debates with far right and alt right propagandists. Uh, Vouch is basically subscribed to by 341 hundred thousand people. I mean, that reach is, is unlike anything uh, that, that earlier sort of print-based socialist media publications could, could garner. <laughs> Another interesting YouTube channel is Tom Nicholas, a PhD student uh, who's subscribed to by about 150,000 um, people. Um, this What the Theory series basically features Marxist humanities explainer videos, things like cultural materialism, Raymond Williams, cultures and structures of feeling, uh, a really, really sort of sharp uh, uh, video channel. Um, another is Angie Speaks, um, who creates really entertaining, it's super sharp, super sort of smart socialist videos um, based upon some existing works like Mark Fisher's Exit the Vampire Castle. Um, and the most recent video um, that's, that's gaining a lot of traction is Why I'd Rather Talk About Class, which is a really, really interesting engagement with the Joker movie. So that's just YouTube. I mean, it's like literally there's hundreds of socialist media uh, content creators, even political entertainers that again are garnering audiences in, in hundreds of thousands. Um, also on, on Facebook, of course, you have every socialist sort of imaginable, every socialist organization using that platform to publicize its events, to sort of build movements, to sort of spread uh, its, its uh, media content. Um, on uh, live game streaming platforms such as Discord and Twitch, socialists from all over the world are meeting in real time to debate and hash out socialist politics and to influence people on the right and on the liberal center. Um, on TikTok, um, socialists are posting funny political pitches to popular songs and trying to exercise some influence through that platform. Um, on Reddit, the uh, Our Socialism, um, there are thousands of threads about all kinds of socialist questions and answers, such as, am I too young to be a socialist? And what are the best books on the economic aspects of socialism? Um, on Instagram, um, you basically have a whole bunch of meme makers and meme creators, such as uh, socialism memes and sassy socialist memes that are creating, posting, and spreading all kinds of humorous and funny memes. Um, on Twitter, um, people, uh, of course, are connecting with one another across borders, forming sort of socialist sort of solidarity communities and tweeting their ideas far and wide. Um, and of course, there's hundreds of podcasts as well that have emerged over the past decade. Um, and one of those uh, featured here is Seasons of the, Season of the Bitch, a socialist feminist uh, podcast. So what exactly are socialists doing um, on these social media platforms? Well, on these social media platforms, socialists are challenging uh, the neoliberal common sense of much bourgeois media and its apologists for the status quo. They're also directly engaging and attacking the ideology of far-right propagandists with the goal of connecting with people where they're at, with the goal of winning them to socialism. On platforms, socialists are constructing positive socialist identities for themselves and conveying these to the world. Now, representing oneself as a socialist in a positive fashion, perhaps with a rose emoji on Twitter, for example, is a way to proudly express this identity and be recognized for it, which is an important political symbolic act given the long history of anti-socialist shame campaigns in the mainstream media and in the United States more generally. On platform, self-identified socialists are also searching for, forming, and participating in virtual socialist communities. These communities basically unbind socialist interaction from the constraints of geography or place, and they become new meeting spaces for socialists spread across cities, regions, and countries. So here we are right now on Zoom, uh, communing uh, about sort of the significance of socialist media on social media platforms. So um, on platform, socialists are also self-educating. So on YouTube, a learner can subscribe to free courses such as Reading Marx's Capital with David Harvey, engage with over a decades of, of recorded lectures featuring hundreds of educators on the Socialist Project's left stream channel, read Vivek Chibber's The ABCs of, of Capitalism pamphlet series alongside the video series. You know, flesh and blood educators will always matter. But for the many people that cannot access often urban-based socialist organizations um, or even necessarily enroll in college or university where they might meet a Marxist 
socialist professor. These platforms are playing a very helpful role in making connections and making new socialists. So for the most of the 20th century, the socialist left was largely kept out of the mass media and cultural industries. But all of the above examples demonstrate how in the 21st century, socialists are logged on to massively populated social media platforms and commuting their ideas everywhere to anyone at any time. In digital capitalism, socialists are finding ways to produce, circulate, and consume abundant socialist media expressions in opposition to capitalism. So given the, the mass media industry's history of filtering out and demonizing socialists, these are all significant positive developments. Nonetheless, there are limits to socialist communications on social media platforms too, and I'll just conclude with those. So socialist interactivity on much of the internet, especially socialist media platforms, perpetuates the profit and reproduces the market power of the big five, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. For the past decade, the big five's market capitalization, scale of operations, and user base have grown immensely. And they're valued today at more than $5 trillion. They basically influence almost the totality of the global internet's infrastructure, accumulation logics, laws, policies, and regulations, and even the ideological orientation of the digital media environment as a whole. So when we log into these social media platforms and we use them for our political communications, we in many ways get used by what Jody Dean long ago conceptualized as communicative capitalism or what Nick Chernichek recently calls platform capitalism. So to use these platforms, we must first consent to their owner's conditions. And when clicking accept, we become users subject to the corporation's terms of service, policies, and community guidelines. Of course, that means we agree to let these companies collect data about everything we do and say well online. So socialists may be doing a form of unpaid digital labor and functioning as an exploitable prosumer commodity for these incredibly powerful companies. Also, you know, doing our politics through, the, through these platforms is risky because the relationship between platform owners and socialist users is not democratic um, by any stretch of the imagination. Platforms are accountable to their shareholders first, their advertisers second, and their users third. These companies could deplatform socialists and delete our pages and content whenever they like. And there's emerging, emerging instances of them doing just that uh, with very little explanation as to why. Uh, another issue is that platform capitalism or digital capitalism's data valence of us through these platforms is starting to converge and has been converging with um, state surveillance of citizens. And so while platforms have made socialists more visible to the mainstream and to more and more people far and wide, these platforms also potentially put every socialist that uses them in the security state surveillance crosshairs. So if the socialist left ever one day became a serious challenge to the status quo, the NSA officer would only need to turn to Facebook for a registry of the who's who of the 21st century socialist left. While the internet and social media platforms are enabling socialists to communicate in ways that were not possible in the pre-digital world of the mass media and cultural industries, there are major limits and risks to doing so. For now though, we should use these platforms and continue to build outside of and around them as well. In the end, social media platforms are supplements to, not substitutes for, the building of democratic socialist organizations and working class movements. And today, as always, that remains the key socialist challenge, on and off, with and through social media platforms. Thank you. Thank you, Tanner. Um, there, I was about to ask you to put the screen back and you you got it done. Uh, thank you very much. I am sitting here on this screen and I see that the editor of my favorite book, the, and I keep calling this year's register an organizer's manual because there is so much that explains what we need to know. We, unfortunately, I did not recognize Leo Panich at the beginning. This whole series and all our series this season are dedicated to the many, many decades that Leo put in to make possible us to be here, even though we're all on Zoom and not in a room together. But Greg Elbow is here, who is the co-editor, has done tremendous work in helping us organize this, but more importantly, organizing the volume. And I, I'm turning the floor over to Greg to go from you, Tanner, over to Derek. Greg. Thank you for coming. Yes. Um, 
Thanks, thanks, Michael. Um, Leo and I are were uh, are very pleased with this volume. I think these two presentations, uh, essays by uh, Tanner and Derek, are reflective of what we wanted to accomplish. Uh, both a, 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 a an intense criticism and assessment of high tech capitalism, uh, in particular its digital forms. Uh, and a critique of what is and uh, pointing to uh, what might be in terms of uh, new ways of living. Derek is a colleague of mine from uh, York University. I've known him for quite a while. Uh, he has a fantastic book out on, uh, on digital technologies called the title The Limits of Digital Revolution. His essay in this year's register is on imagining platform socialism and explores uh, alternative ways we might think of socializing the digital media, in particular the underlying infrastructure, allowing access to a variety of forms. Derek, please present your marvelous essay. In this. Thank you very much, Greg, um, for, for that. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. And, and I'll thank also Michael and everybody at the Marxist Education Project. Uh, this is a, a great opportunity. Um, I think the register is exactly the kind of thing around which these kinds of events should be held, um, and I'm, I'm quite quite honored to be able to be part of it. Uh, it's, it's a publication of a very long history, but I'm, I'm glad to be part of uh, this year. Um, my essay, which actually follows immediately after Tanner's in this year's volume, um, is, is about, well, it's, it's an attempt to explain how we might imagine a different kind of platform. And this is not uh, to start an argument with Tanner at all. I, 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 I think that he's very right about our need to understand how socialists have been using social media. Um, but at the same time, I, I want to elaborate on the limits that he, he describes for the effectiveness of social media for socialists. Um, because I think that, that there are important limits that we should be aware of and those limits um, really require us to think through what it would be like to have a different kind of internet. I mean, I think by now, there's actually a pretty strong consensus amongst everybody, uh, at least everybody, in, in power, out of power, activists, not that there's something profoundly wrong with our information systems. The, the structure of social media is one in which a very few and very powerful monopolies dominate a significant part of the sphere of public discourse. And this domination um, does significant harm to our polity. And the alternative that I try to sketch out in this essay is a relatively utopian one. I think and that's necessarily the case. Um, I'm trying to fix the problem with, but within the scope of the existing capitalist organization of information economy, it's, there, there really isn't room to fix the real problems. So I'll say a bit about, about what's in the essay, but first I should mention that since uh, I submitted this to Greg and Leo um, sometime last year, there's been a number of really important developments that have gone on. All kinds of things continue to happen. And I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping up with all the news about, about how social media are being governed and the politics around that. And two, two events um, in particular deserve mention. One, of course, is, is the events on January 6th uh, in Washington. Um, and the other one is much more recent that's happened over the last week. Um, but let me just say that the, the storming of the Capitol, I think, has made the urgency of, of the things I'm talking about in this essay even more clear. Um, because it's not really, the threat isn't just that there is a particularly dangerous political formation that is being incited to violently oppose democratic institutions. That, that eruption of violence was merely a manifestation of a much more deeply systemic crisis. Uh, that has very important dimensions in the world of information. So on the one hand, what happened that day can, might be seen as a sort of a climax to a whole narrative that had been building uh, with tension over uh, the a crisis of information that began. Um, this narrative might have been seen to begin in 2016 when the revelations came out about Russian interference in, in the US election. Um, but on the other hand, I think it would be a mistake to think that that was a climax that ended the story and that the danger has subsided now that that event happened and the Capitol was cleared um, and Biden's inaugurated and Trump is removed from his social media platforms. That, that doesn't end the story. I mean, I think most of us are quite relieved uh, when Trump is no longer able to spew his hatred on Twitter um, and other platforms that his base has been sort of deprived of that opportunity to communicate. But 
nobody who cares about democracy should be satisfied with the way that that happened. And the fact is that six unelected billionaires made some decisions that deprived the sitting president of the United States of his ability to communicate in the most broad way possible. And not only did they remove him of his access to those platforms, but the previously obscure but completely unmoderated platform known as Parler, to which many of his supporters retreated after that, uh, was removed from its hosting space on Amazon Web Services and from Apple and Google's app stores. And I, I venture to suggest that this kind of power over the capacity, this kind of concentration of power over the capacity to communicate globally has probably never existed before. And in case anybody's unclear about the nature of this threat to democracy, all we have to remember is that one of the accounts that uh, Jack Dorsey of Twitter decided to suspend was the at POTUS account. It's the account that, uh, it's, it's a Twitter account, so technically it belongs to Twitter as a corporation, but it's recognized as the official account of the elected president of the United States. And Twitter just decided that no, the president couldn't use that anymore. And, and I, I just, I think that we need to remind ourselves, like this was a private decision by a very small group of people who have no accountability to the public as a whole over how political communication is gonna happen across the country and around the world. And, and I'm not saying anything that, that is, is widely disputed here, even Jack Dorsey, um, sent out a series of tweets suggesting that he shouldn't really have that kind of power that made, made him very uncomfortable to be in a position to need to make that decision. But if they've got too much power, what can we do about this? Uh, it, it seems there is a bipartisan consensus that something needs to change. In the United States, both Republicans and Democrats are agreed that something needs to be done about this law uh, known as Section 230. It's the surviving part of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, which was struck down uh, by the Supreme Court, except for this one section, which grants platforms immunity from prosecution for the way that they moderate or fail to moderate online discussion. So even if they're intervening in the flow of information to prevent some kinds of information from getting through to people, they can't be held liable for doing it well or poorly or overdoing it or underdoing it. it, it section 230 grants them that kind of immunity for most things. Now, what exactly to do about it is not clear. There's a bipartisan consensus that something needs to be done, but it's gonna be a really tough struggle because a lot of people think that Section 230 is actually what made the internet as valuable as it is. I mean, Tanner showed us so very effectively that these services have been of enormous import uh, to socialist activists. And by extension, like all kinds of political activists can depend on the internet as a sphere of relatively free speech that empowers all kinds of individuals, people who are not corporations. And so getting rid of Section 230 is going to be very, very controversial, but something's got to be done about it, and we don't know what to do. Some of the countries think they know, and there's, there's legislative action happening in a lot of countries. Uh, the Canadian government is actually continuing to tell us that any day now, it's going to have a kind of platform regulation bill. We don't know what's in it, though. The United Kingdom has announced an online harms bill, which is similar to, uh, to Europe's digital services bill that they're about to implement. It builds on Germany's Network Enforcement Act. Uh, basically, these things require platforms to remove hateful or illegal forms of speech um, within a short time period or face extremely high fines in the billions of dollars range. And the second development that I think is worth talking about actually is, is the most important um, conflict over this kind of regulation. And if you've been following the news about communication at all, you've, you've heard about this. Australia um, decided to pick a big fight with Facebook. I think uh, I have this imagining of, of Australia and a whole bunch of other countries being represented by kids in the schoolyard. And one of them gets picked to go and pick a fight with the bully to try to shut him down. Um, and, and, and of course, Australia had to do something about this or somebody had to do something about this because these platforms are just causing a hemorrhaging of advertising dollars away from local or national media into the global pockets of the platforms. Of course, Facebook called their bluff and said, well, look, if you force us to pay for news to the news media industry, we'll just stop allowing news to be posted on Facebook in Australia. And they did that. And uh, this morning's news is that I, I think 
the way to read it is that Australia blinked and said, okay, fine, we won't actually impose this law on you quite so strictly. Seems like Australia blinked, uh, time will tell whether that's exactly what happened, but it seems to me like Facebook uh, saved itself there with, with, with calling Australia's bluff. So it's unclear what we can do. Australia versus Facebook is, is a debate that a lot of uh, companies uh, or a lot of countries are gonna be looking at um, to see how it goes. Canada's Minister of uh, Heritage has said that they're, they're, they're maybe thinking of following Facebook. France has done some similar things, Spain as well. But the argument I wanna make about these limits to the ability of, of um, democratic communication on, on these platforms is to suggest that such attempts to legislate limiting the harms that social media do are unlikely to ever be effective. They might be effective on the grounds if they are the grounds are defined very narrowly, but I think there's a lot of different kinds of harms that need to be dealt with that aren't going to get dealt with. Violent and extremist hate speech, for instance, is a big problem on the internet. Everybody knows this. And it's clear that the platforms will do what they are legally required to do to remove um, the most obviously illegal forms of speech. That's what Germany's Network Enforcement Act is about. Disinformation is a bit harder to um, make illegal. And so we really have to rely on the platforms to self-regulate to deal with that problem. Um, the way that the platforms often uh, foster filter bubbles and echo chambers that uh, just undermine democratic discourse by uh, polarizing debate and making it impossible for people to actually listen to each other because they, they're exposing themselves to completely different facts. Uh, the way privacy is violated is a huge problem. Uh, Tanner mentioned that a bit too, so I won't go into that. Um, but also the degradation, this is what Australia is trying to deal with, the degradation of the financial basis of the production of reliable political journalism. News can't make money anymore because all the advertising dollars are going to Facebook and Google, and they're not using that money to pay for very much news production. Now, some of these problems you can ameliorate to some extent with some of these proposals that are on the table, but none of them are likely to go away as a result of any of these regulatory measures, I, I argue. And, and when we consider all these different problems that we need to confront, and we look at the root causes of all of them, it all turns out that if it weren't for the business model that commercial social media platforms are based on, which is to uh, attract and capture as much audience attention as possible and then sell it to the advertisers, this is behind all of it. They, the platforms are operated the way they are because they are serving the needs of their customers and the customers and the advertisers, and they're not serving the needs of the users. They, they simply don't exist to foster democratic deliberation. No matter how much Facebook talks about connecting the world to each other. What they are really doing is selling the world to the advertisers, selling the world's attention. So the informational needs of the public are always going to come second as long as that is the case. So if you understand the problem as the mass media industries are losing advertising revenue, you might be able to solve that problem by forcing Facebook or Google to cough up some, some dollars here and there and give them to mass media industries. But as many people pointed out in, in the Australian case, that's just gonna take money away from Facebook and Google and give it to Rupert Murdoch. And that's not actually gonna make more quality journalism likely at all. Similarly, if you just mandate the removal of hate speech, that's fine. And we, it's gonna be a long time before we actually have a consensus on what that actually means. Um, but a lot of the content that we worry about undermining democracy isn't really, uh, or, or pushing people to more and more radical and extremist critiques isn't really hate speech, it isn't even illegal. Conspiratorial thinking, um, arguing that, that an election was stolen, um, you can't make that illegal. And that's going to be a huge free speech issue if you try. And so there's all kinds of ways that th there's, there's content that just can't be made illegal and you can't force platforms to remove because it's not going to ever be illegal. The real problem, I think, is that the platforms are using algorithmic determinations to figure out what kind of content to promote and what kind of content to recommend. YouTube's next up and Facebook's, you should consider joining this group all of these kinds of things that Facebook is 
not having human beings sort through which groups to recommend to which people, but using a platform, uh, using their, their platform's algorithm, which is programs to maximize engagement. That's their term for it. It's designed to capture as much attention as possible. And that means provoking emotional reactions like shock and outrage. And these things, this kind of undermining of democracy is, I think, something that's made very, very hard to regulate. There's proposals out there about making algorithms transparent, making them auditable. But again, these are basically proprietary algorithms that the companies use in order to uh, promote their own business interests. They are kept secret for a reason. And I very much doubt that the companies are going to let them be publicly audited anytime soon. So what can be done? Well, as the title suggests, I think we need to imagine socialist platforms. We need to imagine a platform that is not a capitalist one that replaces the privately owned commercially supported networks uh, with something that's supported and administered publicly. But of course, as soon as you talk about the public version of the media thing, we need to avoid the, the um, tendency to revert to what we have in the broadcast world. Publicly funded broadcasters are, are wonderful things, um, and, and, but we need, to, we need to be much more careful than simply suggesting that we nationalize Facebook for a whole bunch of reasons. Primarily, I think, there's a number of reasons, but the one I would focus on is that public broadcasting is, is, is a worthwhile endeavor and it can be done in ways that allow news production a lot of freedom from partisan political interests and a lot of freedom from the need to commodify audiences so it can balance, uh, it can be a force that balances against the most crass commercial interests that otherwise dominate commercial media. But the result is often a very sort of staid and overly cautious kind of content that is averse to risk or innovation. And I would suggest that the needs of a social media platform designed to allow individuals to communicate with each other uh, without some kind of uh, big brother looking over your shoulder or perhaps anti-BB or however you wanna think of it. Um, you really need to know that that discussion is freed up, that there are bounds set uh, around the discussion and that they're set fairly without a bias built into it. And, and, and even if there isn't a bias, participants in such discussions need to know that that bias is not there. And I don't think that's ever gonna be the case if we were to have a publicly run social media platform the way we have public broadcasters. Now, fortunately, we don't actually need to have that kind of thing to be a public platform. Um, Existing platforms are, are these things with great centralized control. And I'm suggesting that we don't wanna just simply shift centralized control to the state. I'm suggesting that we can actually have ones without centralized control, although it's a difficult argument to make. But if we remember how the internet originally worked, it might actually be something we can imagine a little bit more easily. We don't need the centralized center of, of control anymore. That only is needed by the existing platforms because they sell advertising. And in fact, it makes the social media platforms much more profitable because with the centralized control over everybody's data, they have the ability to aggregate the data from all users in order to maximize the value to advertisers who can then identify users very, very specifically using patterns across the data of billions of users to find the ones who would be most profitable to target. But the internet doesn't require that. In fact, if the internet has any defining characteristic, it's this ability to connect users of different computer networks together without a central administrator. And in fact, we've probably, in fact, I'm, I'm quite sure everybody listening has already made use quite recently of such a, a, a network, and that is the network of email across the world. Email does not require any one central company to run it all. We've all had to register for this Zoom and, and got a link through an email, I'm assuming, and, and that didn't happen through any one company's network. It's, of course, Zoom is a centralized system, but, but I'm talking about email, right? Email, uh, e anybody can run an email server, set up email accounts. All you've gotta be doing is using the shared protocols that have been developed for this purpose. And my argument uh, for an alternative to capitalist platforms can be summed up very quickly. Let's build a social media platform for sharing information the way email works. <laughs> 
Email works because there's protocols for organizing the information when we send an email message from one person to another. Those protocols were developed openly and shared openly by people who were working in the early days of the internet long before anybody imagined the, the internet would ever have any commercial applications. So they gave away the, the, the software and let anybody set up an email server on their local network and then offer email addresses to anybody else. And so anybody could send an email to anybody else. Why don't we just have that for social media? Why does all our traffic have to go through Facebook servers? Why does all of our internet activity that generates all this information about what we're doing, why does all that information have to get stored collectively in, in, in Facebook's database of everybody's information? Now the details are only sketched out roughly in the essay. So if you're, if you're curious, I hope you will have a chance to read it. And if you know more about network protocols than I do, I'd love to hear your feedback because I'm not an expert on this, but the technical details aren't really my point. The point is we need an alternative to the current system which serves the needs of advertisers over users and doesn't allow users to make the important decisions about how about the conditions under which we communicate. Such, a, such an open source shared protocols could actually allow users to determine the algorithms that sort the information that they see and could, could rely on any number of uh, publicly available services that could filter content for you. You could have much more control over how you communicate this way. Now, of course, Having this is going to very much require uh, that we don't have commercial platforms like Facebook in monopoly positions. Uh, a, a publicly operated open source platform simply won't be able to compete with them. Open source projects are hard enough to sustain anyways, but I, I suggest that there is a role for public authorities to play here, recognizing the open source project when it develops protocols and perhaps even funding or promoting uh, market and marketing, if you like, uh, coordinating the project, uh, making sure that people know that there is an alternative that actually allows you to do what you want rather than uh, meet the conditions that Facebook sets or Twitter or YouTube. When I think about this part of it, like we have to actually get rid of and eliminate the commercial platforms, that always struck me as a bit of a, a difficult thing to argue until this last week, when we saw the government of Australia actually go so far as to say, well, Facebook, we want to impose regulations and Facebook saying, well, if you want to impose them, we don't want to do business there. And so it makes me wonder if it might be possible for governments to gradually increase, it'd have to be radically different kinds of governments, of course, but progressive governments might be encouraged to actually impose increasing levels of regulation on these networks and curtail the capacity for them to behave in the ways that they have to the point where people might find a different kind of network worthwhile. Now, I know that's obviously not gonna happen tomorrow. Um, and, and, and I'm admitting that my proposal here is quite utopian, um, but I think we should explore how such a thing might work. It would have to work in a, in a context with a couple of other changes too. We would have to have publicly controlled infrastructure, I think, uh, the, the physical connections between us and, and local network providers would probably have to come under public control. And we'd probably also have to have public funding for the production of serious journalism and other forms of artistic content in ways that insulate it much more from the, the uh, exigencies of partisan state politics. Than, than exist right now in public media services. I think such things could be developed. And I think if those three things work together, um, it could actually create a much greater capacity for members of the public to be in control of how they communicate. I should also say, I'm aware this is not gonna solve all the problems because it's still going to allow the extremists and the fascists and everybody else that we think are a danger to democracy to operate their own platforms, filter their own traffic the way they want to. And this is something that is not desirable. Um, I just don't think there's a way to, to do that, uh, to get rid of that through communication politics. To get rid of that, we have to win the arguments. And I think having communication structures under which the conditions of communication are set by the people who make use of it would allow us to engage in those struggles on a level playing field. And thus we would be able to engage in that kind of struggle between different visions of what it means to live in a society together more effectively than we can now with commercial platforms. So that's what I'm suggesting might 
be possible and might be something worth working towards. And even if, uh, even if what I'm describing here isn't really feasible, uh, the, the point I would want to make is that if we're really serious about solving the problems with our existing communication systems, we need to think much more deeply and more carefully about the material interests that are shaping the conditions under which we communicate. And we need to develop alternatives to those conditions because those systems and those conditions shape the way members of the public learn and under, learn about and understand the world around them and their relationship to it. And right now, those material interests are driving very dangerous political formations. They haven't gone away. They will be back. Uh, and they will be exploiting and mobilizing the most anti-democratic sentiments within us, within the public, because they need to extract private profit from, our, from the communicative and political activity online. And so there's a great deal at stake. We need to get this right, and we desperately need an alternative to the way communication is being structured in the current time. Thank you.